Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I just thought I would do a little Zoom because I was getting a lot of questions um, from some of my friends who are just feeling uncertain about what to do next school year and um, looking at all the options available with distance learning through public schools or private schools. And um, what an alternative option could be is homeschooling. Um, I know a lot of charters right now are not accepting students based off of um, one of the laws or one of the bills that will most likely pass, it's looking like, we'll see. Um, but we're gonna be answering more questions about how you can still homeschool through a PSA. Um, that stands for private school affidavit. Um, and how a lot of families do that. Um, it really just opens up the options for curriculum. You're not um, stuck choosing the one that is chosen by the public school you attend, but you can look at other options. So um, that's why we kind of wanted to give a little bit of a homeschool 101 tonight and talk about, we're gonna touch on a couple foundational things. Um, in my original post, I talked about a lot of things that I wanted to present on, but as Shannon and I were preparing for this, we realized, wow, there's a lot of meat to this. So I won't be touching on um, all of the things I originally said, but if you guys have any questions about it, please feel free to ask during the Q&A time, or um, I would be happy to um, you know, reach out to you individually and talk about some of the other things. So just wanted to preface it with that. Um, but let's get started. So I will start. My name is Kirsten Mentink. I am a mom to four boys, um, five and under. My oldest is turning six next week. So um, we have been homeschooling. We started homeschooling um, like homeschoolers who have been doing it forever. They say, oh, we've homeschooled from birth, which, you know, as a mom, you are your child's first teacher. So you teach your kids how to walk. You teach them how to talk. You teach them how to do all those things. And really, it's a natural step into teaching them academics. And you don't have to have a credential to be a homeschool teacher. Um, there's so many wonderful homeschool moms that I've met through my career that have no experience teaching and they do phenomenal jobs. So um, I am a homeschool teacher. I um, got my credential from Sac State and a couple of my friends who are in that program are actually on tonight. So that's really awesome. Um, and I've been a homeschool teacher for going on six years. Um, I've worked at a couple different charters and um, I've really gleaned a lot of knowledge from my homeschool families um, who really teach me the most because they're doing it in and out every day. Um, I homeschooled um, my children for the first time last year. My oldest um, was in kindergarten and we are doing a second year of kindergarten this upcoming year. So um, it was great to kind of have that background knowledge of the families that I've been homeschooling and knowing what they love and what has worked for them to kind of figure out and narrow down the options for us. I do tend to lean as far as homeschool philosophies towards Charlotte Mason and classical style and we'll go into what those are in a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's me. On to Shannon. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, Kirsten and I have known each other for a few years. We worked together at a couple different charter schools. Um, and so I am a homeschooling mom to seven children and also a Mimi, that's my grandma name, to three kiddos. Um, I've been doing the homeschool thing for about 20 plus years. And I also have worked for charter schools in California for about the same amount of time. But about six months ago, I took a um, different path for my career, and now I'm teaching teachers how to support homeschooling families. So it's really exciting because I've taken all that knowledge and experience and developed courses now for teachers and also for parents too, but mostly my focus is just really, my heart is really to um, teach the teacher now, especially with 
where we're at in our culture and, and all these teachers that are supporting virtual learning and remote learning, um, just to equip them to how uh, to know how to support the homeschooling family. Um, so I have used all kinds of curriculum in, in, you know, the 20 years I've been doing this and I call my kids guinea pigs sometimes because when I, I love curriculum and I love to try out new things. And so some of my favorite philosophies or, or types of, um, curriculum are with the Charlotte Mason bent or unit study. And I like traditional four times in my life when I'm a little bit busier and I need my kiddos to be more independent. Um, so I've used all those three uh, types off and on throughout the years. And we'll talk more about those in a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this quote just spoke so much to my heart. And I have to give credit to Kirsten for this quote. A mother's heart is the child's classroom. I have a, uh, my courses go under a business called Heart of Homeschooling. And it just like, oh my gosh, that's like so exactly what it's all about. Like the heart of homeschooling is really not just the mother, it's the father too. Because I see some guys on here. It's the mom and the dad. It's your home that you're creating for your family. That is your child's classroom, and that is the heart of homeschooling. So it's a beautiful quote. I really like that. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah. Okay. So you were going to cover the agenda, right? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to touch on these three topics tonight. We're going to talk about planning your year and how there's a lot of flexibility in that. Um, when you homeschool, when you step away from um, the public school, there is flexibility in your calendar year and how you schedule things. And also I'll touch on a couple um, ways that you can schedule your days. The second thing we'll talk about are um, homeschooling styles and learning styles. And then we will talk about curriculum and how um, depending on the homeschool style that you guys lean towards and the learning styles of your children, you can um, it'll help you narrow down what curriculum works best for them. Okay, so um, this is just going to talk about some options for planning out your year. Um, this is in no way comprehensive. This is just some um, options that you can look at. And it just, I wanted to just kind of open people's eyes on um, the flexibility in homeschooling and um, how you can really pick and choose what works best for your family. So you have the family to make, or you have the freedom to make the school year fit your family. You can slice and dice 36 weeks of school and 16 weeks off for what works for you. And um, these are just a couple options. The traditional school schedule, which as I was preparing this, I've, I've actually learned <laughs> some things as I was preparing for this. Um, and I thought it was super interesting that the traditional school schedule was um, implemented a long time ago based off of families who were farming. And um, they did the nine months of the school year um, when they were in school and then three months off during the summer because that was when the children were needed at home to help with the harvesting. So I'm like, oh, that's a really interesting. Okay. That's it. So right there. We literally just talked about this at the table the other day because my kids were wondering it about it. And yeah. So we looked it up and we learned all about it. And then they were like, well, mom, if we do school over summer, can we skip a grade then? And I was like, well, you maybe, but it's really like not like that. You know, you just spread out. Like if you're going to do a year long, long school, you just spread out the curriculum to last all through the year, like typically that's what yeah. happens. But it was just interesting, like how they were kind of thinking outside the box and they're, oh, can I graduate from high school at 12 then? Right. <laughs> <laughs> how can I use this to my advantage? Yeah, totally. I was like, oh, that's so interesting to know that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then another option you can do, which I know a couple of families that do this option are three 12 week terms. So they do 12 weeks on, and that's like, Four, five days of school a week, um, and then five weeks off for a little bit of a break, and then repeat. And people like to do that because it kind of just, you know, it, it prevents a lot of burnout later on if you are just, if you know that you're doing it for 12 weeks and um, 
you, it's just less likely, you're less likely to burn out because honestly, that's one thing that I struggled with this last year when I was homeschooling. It's like, okay, I got it down for like August through October and then <laughs> I start to lose my steam a little bit. So um, this option I think is a really great thing if you kind of foresee that being you too. Um, another option is three weeks on, one week off. Another just um, way that you can concentrate on school um, for a certain amount of time and then give yourself that break. And another is four days per week, which works out to 45 weeks on and seven weeks off. So just some, just some ideas to put in your head, some ways to um, keep things flexible for your family. I know lots of people um, homeschool and kind of like travel around the country or camp a lot or things like that. And there's flexibility where you can, don't have to stress about, oh my gosh, my kids aren't learning right now. Are they going to fall behind? So um, just wanted to share that with you guys. Okay, awesome. This is me. So um, I'm going to talk about different ways you can schedule your homeschool day. And there's not just two ways. There's a million different ways you can homeschool. Um, it, it's so great to just personalize it depending on your family's needs. But these are some of the two most popular ways people usually schedule their time. And I do recommend having a schedule, but just be careful that your schedule doesn't rule your house because then it really kind of changes the whole climate. I know moms that have, you know, they're kind of perfectionist and they just really, really want it to be perfect. And so they make this perfect schedule and then they're like yelling at their kids because they're not on schedule. And, you know, it's really important to remember you're homeschooling so you can personalize the education. Maybe your child is going to take a little bit longer with this math lesson and that's okay. So just remember the schedule is there as a tool, but it's not going to rule your house. So the two different schedules we're going to look at are timetables and time boxes. Timetables um, just basically is like your classic schedule where everything has a certain amount of time and it takes place at a certain amount of, or at a certain time in the day. And then time boxes are more like where you schedule um, a subject in a, in a part of the day, more of a rhythm to the day. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at timetable first. So this is an example of a family with a third grader and a fifth grader. And you can see they're both kind of on the same schedule at the beginning, 7.30, they have breakfast, which is about 20 minutes. And then they go into scripture memory, hymn study, morning chores. Both kids are doing all of these things at the same time. Mom's probably, or dad's probably, you know, um, coaching them along. They're doing these other things. And then um, the... Then you see at 8.15, they go into their own individual subjects because of course a third grader and a fifth grader are not gonna be doing the same math curriculum or the same English curriculum. And so they're gonna be doing their individual subject areas at that point. And mom again, or dad again, is going to be right there making sure they're progressing if they have any questions, just like in a classroom, you would see them working independently. Um, then we see a break. And then they're going into other subjects after the break, again, that they're doing together, it looks like, on the schedule. That's why it's going across. Um, and they're done at 10.30. Then from 10.30 to 3, it's open on this schedule. Um, they probably have, I, I call it productive free time in my house. And I have a list of things that my kiddos can do during productive free time. This is the time that they can choose to do um, knitting if they're into that or movie making or going on the computer and practicing Spanish you know whatever it is that is an interest to them we just happen to call it productive free time or PFD I'll put, I'll put it on the board that way and then at three it looks like the family gets back together to have a snack and some family read aloud and a lot of times that read aloud time can take place at the kitchen table and the mom or the dad can then read a chapter from a story while everyone's having a snack and so it's you know kind of you know fun because they're, they're getting fed while you're covering a school subject. Um, so that is timetable. And okay, then and I, wanted, I wanted to just talk yeah. a little bit really fast about read aloud. And just, if you guys have looked into the read aloud family, or if you haven't, I um, really encourage you to, um, there's a podcast called read aloud revival. It's from Sarah McKenzie and she has a book called read aloud 
family, I think. Um, and it just talks about all of the benefits that can come from reading aloud to your kids. And um, it's just so inspirational. Their website is really great. It has, um, I know my sister-in-law and I have done this where they, she has on her website monthly book lists so like for June, for example, I think it was like ponds was the theme. So she had a list of all these picture books about ponds and um, you can check those out at your library or um, purchase them if you want. And um, she also has like for older kids, like great um, read alouds or um, novels for teen boys, teen girls. Um, like babies, toddlers, everything. So it's just a wealth of knowledge. Um, that's the Read Aloud Revival. Yes. And this is a book by <laughs> Sarah McKenzie. It's a very, very quick read. Really good book if you're looking for um, some oh, yes. more Teaching from Rest by Sarah McKenzie. Um, just get some encouragement on the homeschooling lifestyle. And just to piggyback on what you were saying, Kirsten, I, when my, um, when we were going to the library regularly, um, I, one of my concerns was that I didn't have the time to be reading and, um, making sure that the books my kids were picking out were books I wanted them to read. Cause I don't necessarily want them to read every single type of book that's available to them. Um, it may be, you know, something that I don't want them to necessarily read at their certain age or whatever. So I would print off her book list or other people that I trust their book list. And I would give them to my kids and say, here, you can choose any book on this book list. And it made it really easy for me to manage because that's another thing that's really hard is to, to make sure that, um, they're getting the type of, you know, meat in the literature that you want them to have the vocabulary skills, all of those things that go into the literature that they choose to read. Mm -hmm. So just a little tip on that. We yeah. do have a question that's really applicable to what we're talking about, and I kind of want to address it. Sure. How does um, homeschooling work with little siblings? I'll have a second grader and kindergartner along with a two-year-old and a baby. Many, many hours, or how many hours would each school-age child need my one-on-one -on -one attention? And that is such a good question. Um, I would first say that if, as soon as you can get your children to be reading independently, it frees a lot of your one-on-one -on -one time because then they can read the directions themselves. You don't have to read the directions to them. So really focusing on um, how to read and getting them strong, getting them to be a strong reader early on, but it is uh, very challenging. Kirsten probably can, you know, is living that life right now. Yes. Um, really, really though, just know that you do not have to spend a ton of hours in those early elementary years. It's more about consistency. Mm -hmm. I always like compare it to learning to play the piano. If you want your child to learn to play the piano well, have them practice 10 to 15 minutes a day rather than once a week for 30 or 45 minutes. You know, they're going to progress so much faster just with little bite-sized chunks consistently. And the same goes with those early elementary years, especially. So you don't need a large amount of time. Take advantage of nap time. So when the baby's sleeping, when the toddler's sleeping, sit down on the couch and do your reading practice time, do your math time, get the three R's in, while it's quiet. Kirsten, do you have anything else to add? I was just trying to look through my phone. I saw a, um, a table, somebody on Facebook posted it and it was like how much academic time. Um, oh yeah. I saw that age group yep. and yep. I'm, oh my gosh, I, I meant to share it. Yep. I'm going to write it down. We'll add it to the website. Okay. Perfect. Cause it really, I feel like takes a lot of burden off of it does. Off of the parents when you realize really like when you break down the academic time in public school, it's not an eight hour day. Like no. you, you don't need to match the time your kids are in school to the time that they're doing academics every day. So, so um, yeah, I, oh, sorry. I'm, you're echoing. I'm echoing. Okay. I think that's better now. So yeah, we can talk about that more when one of us finds that. <laughs> but yeah, 
it's a, it's a really good sheet and what she's saying and and you remember like the productive free time is just as important as the traditional academics mm -hmm. you want your children to have free time to be able to dive deeper into their interests it teaches them critical thinking skills it teaches them how to think outside the box and to problem solve they're they're doing this on their own that, that's where you see these kids that are like making movies at 12 years old you know because they would have that time to explore and that's that's just as important as the traditional academics. I can't emphasize that enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, so time boxes. Okay. This is a little bit, um, so you see that it's missing the time there. So I like to call this more of a rhythm calendar, a rhythm schedule. And so it gives a little bit more flexibility. This is great. It, it has third and fifth on there, but I think this is great when you have teens because all of a sudden, you know, before they're 12 or whatever, you know, around that age, you can kind of control their life a little bit more, <laughs> you know, set their time, they get up and then all of a sudden they turn 13 or 14 and they're like sleeping in and you kind of want them to sleep in because if they don't sleep in, they're really grouchy and they're kind of ruining, you know, the whole feel in the house. So this allows some flexibility. Everyone has this rhythm and the routine, but it doesn't necessarily you know, box them into a certain time that they have to meet. Plus a teen, you want them to be more independent. You want them to, you know, these are your subjects you're covering. This is what you're doing daily, but you want them to start gradually becoming responsible for their time. You know, when, when you're an adult, you don't have anyone over you, hopefully telling you what time to get up in the morning. You're responsible for what time you get up and, and all of the responsibilities you have. So that's that transition into that. So I like, I like this kind of um, schedule for when you have like a wide range of kids in your house. Um, but basically it's the same kind of concept as the other schedule, except there's just no, no um, time on the side. And then it just gives the different, I like to call them anchors, the food times, the meal times I call anchors. Because usually when you're homeschooling, you usually get back together during those breakfast, lunch, snack, and dinner times, which is such a blessing because you're all together more often than maybe you were when uh, your kids are in traditional school. So you have that opportunity to teach them more about cooking and more like read, read aloud time during breakfast or whatever it is, but there's more opportunities for learning happening. So those are your anchors, breakfast and lunch and snack. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything else to add, Kristen, to that? I was going to say, and I think it also works well for those families that do have the baby at home and, um, they're not able to stick to a schedule as easily because you have a baby and babies kind exactly. of like create their own schedule. So um, this is one that I, I tend to lean more towards this option when I'm homeschooling my boys because it's easier for me to kind of chunk up the days and be like, okay, we are doing these two things in the morning before chores and those anchors just very if I and it might be a personality thing too like if I see the time slipping by and I haven't gotten to math or whatever I get super stressed out so this allows a little bit more flexibility during this season of life for me um and it also just helps us make sure that we complete everything on time and we don't if we don't keep up with the schedule then you know we'll still um hit those other subjects that we still need to touch on. So yeah, it's a, it's a really great option. Yeah. It's awesome. Okay. So we're going to jump into styles, um, homeschooling, um, philosophies and, um, learning styles. Some of the top homeschool styles or approaches include Charlotte Mason, traditional, classical, unit study, unschooling, and eclectic. And there's more <laughs> past that we'll just touch on these. <laughs> yeah, we had a few more we had to delete because we knew it would just go all night. <laughs> It'd be forever, <laughs> so never <Yeah>. end. <laughs> okay, so um, I am starting with Charlotte Mason. So Shannon and I both um, tend to lean towards Charlotte Mason. I think probably her and I are more eclectic and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but Charlotte Mason um, focuses on the atmosphere of the home. Um, Charlotte Mason, just to give a little background, is a British educator. And um, she saw, um, she went into the schools and kind of saw some of the, um, 
some of the ways that she thought the schools weren't meeting the needs of children. And so she kind of created this philosophy and she has a bunch of books, um, I think seven in her series. And they talk about um, schooling at home, schooling, like how to raise your children. She focuses on um, creating habits early on um, and how our attitude influences our learning. Um, she emphasizes something called living books instead of textbooks or workbooks. And living books are just books that kind of like, you know, never grow old or out of style. They're not like the, um, oh gosh, what is, what is, what does she call Shannon? Twaddle. Twaddle. Twaddle, yes. <laughs> like, for instance, um, Lego Batman books. Those are called twaddle to her because they don't hold, um, just like not a rich life and vocabulary. exactly yeah. yes yeah. and she um she in, in a lot of different charlotte mason curriculums they utilize living books in um learning she's for intentional learning purpose-driven not a lot of busy work um exploration nature she's big on um nature walks and art and music and languages. And I know this sounds like a lot, but she also is for short lessons with consistency, like how Shannon was talking about with young children, how um, you really don't have to like do an hour of math. Like you, you want the, the lessons to be short and rich and full um, and have the consistency of it being an everyday habit. Um, a typical day is two to four hours, and that's on the higher end. Um, for kindergarten, first grade, preschool, she actually recommends that kids don't do any academics until age six. Um, she really focuses a lot on play being a really important um, way of learning um, and how a lot of kids aren't ready to learn until they're six. Um, and academics, I mean, and they're learning so much just through play and through reading. Um, she's big on reading aloud too. Um, and copy work, narration, and dictation. So um, again, it's just those short, consistent lessons that um, help children really grasp a concrete um, knowledge of things. Examples of curriculum, and we'll touch on this a little later too, is Queen Homeschool, Angela O'Dell, Ambleside Online, and Simply Charlotte Mason. And um, just so I think I talked about this at the beginning, but um, we'll be sharing these slides. We'll have it on a resource site for you guys. There's a link right here on all of these uh, philosophies that you can click on, and it'll give a little bit more of an in-depth of um, an in-depth explanation of what it includes, and there's a link right here too. Okay, I'm gonna talk about traditional textbook um, philosophy. And if any of you have sent, or have been sending your kids to like a brick and mortar school, most likely, unless you um, were sending them to more of like a specialized charter school or something like that, they were using a traditional textbook curriculum and most of us were raised on this type of curriculum as well. So we're very familiar with it and a lot of times um, it makes you feel comfortable if you're like a first-time homeschooling mom or dad to use the traditional um, curriculum until you kind of get your feet wet and just really get into the routine of homeschooling. But basically traditional follows um, the core curriculum subjects so all the ones that we're familiar with language arts, math, history, and science and it also covers electives as well. Um, it usually typically will follow either the like the common core standards or the state standards depending on who the publisher is. They include quizzes and tests and graded assignments, all the traditional forms of um, what we see as academics, kind of how we were raised. Um, the homeschool type room setup usually looks like something like you would see in a typical classroom with desks and a chalkboard. Um, and it's, I was just going to say, it was really cool when we first moved to where we live now, my neighbor came over and said, hey, can you use a chalkboard? And I was like, 
I don't know, maybe. And I went out and it was like four feet by six feet. It was this gigantic chalkboard that was vintage. It has this wood frame and it's super cool. Well, we just happened to have a huge blank wall that I had nothing <laughs> to put on yet. So it's in our kitchen and it's been there for 10 years and I love it. I love it because I put everything on it, our schedule and everything and all the kids can see what we're doing that day. So I, I like it, but we're not necessarily traditional homeschoolers. I just like that tool to use. Um, each child is in their own grade level with their own set of grade books and lessons. So for the parent who has four or five or more children, this can be a challenge because that means that you have to kind of preview what they're going to be doing that week. So you kind of know to keep them on track. You have to do the grading unless it's an online curriculum that's self-grading. There is that. And, um, and so there's a little bit more work but the flip side of that, there's less work in the area of arts and crafts. So if you're not like a big, you know, artsy, craftsy type person and want to do a bunch of projects, this curriculum style might be, or this um, philosophy might be something that you would be interested in. This works really well for first year homeschoolers, like I said before, but it also works for, for homeschoolers down the road too. It doesn't, doesn't have to be just first year. Um, there's usually a scheduled lesson plan to follow. So there's usually a teacher's guide that you purchase with all of the students' manuals and students' books and workbooks. And then you follow that plan each day or each week. That's what you would be previewing the week and before, I usually recommend. Um, the lessons are a little bit longer because typically the, the curriculum and this philosophy is created for the classroom. So there's tons of repetition and um, a lot of uh, instruction because it's built for a teacher with 30 kids. So you might need to tweak it a little bit for your own child because they may not need to practice two plus two equals four five times or in five different lessons. Once they get it, they get it, you can move on. So that's how you can customize it and still use this philosophy. Um, a typical day is four to six hours. It's on the longer side, but again, you can customize it to fit the needs of your children. And it can um, be either online, in a textbook, in a workbook, or a combination of those types of things. And some examples of curriculum include a Becca and Bob Jones and Alpha Omega. Those are all from a Christian perspective. And then there's time for learning and K-12 is another one that's not listed there, but we'll go over some examples of curriculum a little bit later on. Yeah. Okay, and classical is the next one. Um, this is also one that I dabble in. <laughs> um, the focus is, oh gosh, sorry, one second. Um, the focus is on where the child's mind development is, and there's different stages in um, each of these um, phases and it's called the trivium. Um, memorization and repetition and analytical thinking and rhetoric. Um, a study for, they study Latin for grammar. There's a lot of Latin roots that um, they're focused on. They read a lot of classical literature. Um, they study great leaders, inventors, artists, scientists, and philosophers. Reading discussion groups is common. Longer lessons, sometimes lasting an hour. Um, so another one that's a little bit more on the longer end, it's um, for typical days, four to six hours. Some examples of curriculum include story of the world, classical academic press, and classical conversations. Um, classical conversations is really great because they also have a built-in co-op um, that a lot of people um, utilize and just adds that community feel to your homeschool. Um, there's other, you know, there's co-ops for all different philosophies and groups, but um, Classical Conversations is well known for that. Um, and um, this is just another um, link that you can click on um, later if you want to dive into Classical a little more. Can I touch a little bit on Classical Conversations? Yeah. So, just because I think Community is really important to me, and we're in a situ situation that it's so hard to build community. And as far as I know, mm -hmm. a lot of the classical conversation community groups are still happening because they're small enough. 
to continue happening. Um, it is a private pay situation because it has a Christian foundation, but um, the families I know that have started in classical conversations love it. And they, their kids are amazing. Like they're so intelligent and just um, polite. And it, it's just, don't you think that like, have you, yeah. have you had families that have used classical conversations? Yeah. And I feel like that. they, they, they like, are advanced even past they're very like, advanced and they're able their communication style is um like just blows me away sometimes mm -hmm. and i think it really is something that's a part of the philosophy just that ability to speak to others eloquently yeah. um and um i just i if if it's important to you to have a community i would strongly recommend looking at classical conversations mm -hmm. just want to plug that in for sure. And the last, um, the last stage of it focuses on, isn't it persuasion? Yeah. Something. Yeah. They, so they, yeah. They, they have to do speech and debate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they have to really learn things very much in depth to be able to, mm -hmm. to persuade on a topic. So yeah. I feel like that's kind of where they, they have a leg up in a lot of ways than <laughs> um, right. some other um, like public um, student or students who go to public schools because they just really just learn it, the ins and outs of things and yeah they're very highly intelligent all of them <laughs> yes okay okay unit study I love unit studies unit studies are basically where um well the, you take it's a thematic approach so either the parent decides hey guys we're gonna learn about um, butterflies this month. And they take that um, theme and they develop um, lessons and there, there's tons of unit studies already developed online that are free. So you don't even have to do it yourself, but basically it touches all the core areas on that one theme. So if you're gonna learn about butterflies, obviously you're gonna touch on science. You might do a butterfly um, experiment. You might write an essay about butterflies read a book about butterflies, do, you know, very little math. Math usually is on its, on its own, but you might, you know, do some little, like for a third grader might do some math lessons on butterflies. Um, but basically you're covering all of those different subject areas that you typically, typically traditionally cover within the one unit study. So it can be really fun. I personally love literature unit studies. So I've, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's down there at the bottom. I've used a Prairie Primer, which takes all of the nine Little House books and you study one per month. So you read the first Little House book and you um, have all the subject areas except for math. You're just tied in with that book. So you learn all the different animals that they've encountered, bears and mountain lions, you write stories, you do projects, all these different things built around the literature. So it's really fun if you like to read um, or if you want to just try out a unit study for a month, it's very easy to do. It's also really easy to do for um, and very family friendly for families that have overlapping grades or multiple grades. If you wanted to, for instance, just do a unit study for history because you want to teach all of your children one time in history together, you can do that as well. So there's a lot of flexibility with unit studies. Mm -hmm. um, it may involve a little bit more preparation depending on if you purchase a unit study packet that's already created for you or if you want to just do one all on your own. You know, it just depends on how much work you want to do, but there can be a lot of printing involved on, you know, and just a lot of preparation, um, but it can be a lot of fun too. So the schedule for unit study may take two weeks or two months, depending on the depth of learning. I used to know a family in Santa Cruz, I used to live in Santa Cruz, and um, the mom just loved unit studies, and she would let her, she had two boys, and she would let them choose the topics for the year. One would choose this, the first semester's unit study topic, and then the other boy would choose the second semester, and they would study together as a family. And sometimes they would need to um, add to the unit study, but they would go really, really deep. They might start with astronauts, and then they'd go into space and into planets, and it would just like dive deep into other subjects based on the beginning unit study. Um, it also incorporates field trips. 
and for the whole family. So whatever you're studying, if you're studying horses, you might want to go visit a farm and you go as a family and you're just incorporating this family learning. Um, it can be virtual learning. So you can watch movies on online about horses, for example, read books, um, research online. There's a lot of research involved for older kids, especially you might give them an assignment to go research a topic and then come back and, um, and teach the rest of the family what they learned. Um, a typical day is two or more area or hours in that um, topic. So just really, it's, it's a huge range of flexibility there. So it just totally depends on what the topic is that you're studying. And then it usually covers everything but math. I mean, that's kind of common sense probably because, you know, math wouldn't be incorporated in any of these topics um, necessarily. And then a lot of families I know that do the unit study approach either um, keep, because I'm sure you can imagine as I'm talking all of the different papers and projects that you can have. So a lot of times they'll um, keep it all in a notebook. That's one way to keep all of the papers from the unit study or lap booking. And lap booking um, is really funny. <clears throat> it's kind of hard to explain, but basically it involves taking a file folder and opening it up and then kind of gluing in your different projects, kind of like a scrapbook. It's kind of like that. And then if the project is really big, when I was a teacher, like Kristen is, I would recommend taking a picture of the project and then printing off the picture and putting it into the notebook or lap book as a memory. And then you don't have to save this gigantic project that you did. <laughs> um, some examples of curriculum, like I mentioned, a Prairie Primer, which is the Little House book series. American Girlhood is another book similar, and it's based on the American Girl books. And then um, there's several other literature unit studies. We've done Charlotte's Web. Um, we've done um, a couple of the um, Narnia series books. So it, it can be a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay, unschooling. Um, this is also known as child-led, interest-led, and personalized learning. Um, people often um, might like judge the word unschooling, um, thinking that it's something that it's not, and it's not no schooling or unparenting. Um, basically what unschooling is, is um, you, kind of step away from your understanding of traditional school and you step into the idea of um how to get your child to love to learn again and um and this is for you know a lot of families um lots of different families do it some families who have had a hard time in public school and they want to try a different option this is something that they move towards um, some families have done this from the beginning um, but it's based around lots of discussion about what that child is interested in and the parents facilitate and coach and encourage the child to explore those interests um, through research so for instance like a like say um, a mom asks their child, okay, what do you want to learn about today? And the child says, I want to learn about frogs. And so you can um, pull up videos about frogs on YouTube and go on a little um, nature walk to a pond and look for frogs and study, um, like, you know, you can even like dissect frogs, like learn, there's so much that you can go into about that topic. And then you can move on to the next one. And it's similar to um, unit studies in that you can touch on a lot of different subjects in there. Um, math sometimes too, but most of the time it's the others. Um, you may or may not use a curriculum, but you can um, use it if, it if it's a tool that can be used as a part of learning about that topic. Um, it's a lot of free reading and exploration. It focuses on learning as a way of life and how learning happens all around us all the time. Um, another great um, topic that kind of just happened naturally with my own kids is we, through um, quarantine, we built a garden or we grew a garden in our backyard and my kids have just become so interested in the different vegetables and how to grow a garden and how it starts from a seed and what happens. And like that is an example of unschooling, kind of like focusing on a topic and learning all about it and getting your kids 
loving to learn again. Um, there's not really a typical schedule or a day. Um, I've seen this, I have a, um, a homeschool teacher friend who is an expert in this and she has seen um, kids all the way up through high school use this philosophy and they are well-rounded, well, very intelligent people who know things so well and have that, um, I just keep coming back to that love of learning. Like that's one thing that kind of sets this apart. Um, and yeah, there's pretty much anything for the curriculum um, that you can use to kind of add in different um, elements to learning about that topic. And there's another video here that you guys can look at. Okay, the last one we're going to talk about is eclectic. And basically, <laughs> I, I mean, eclectic is just, you know, where the parent says, well, well gosh, you know, I really want to do traditional for math because I think math is needs to be black and white and I don't want them to get behind or miss anything. So I want to use a traditional curriculum for math, but gosh, I really want to learn history together this year because it's an election year and I want everybody to learn about what that means and how it works. So I want to do more of a unit study for history. And then I want to do more of a classical approach for language arts because I really like the idea of, you know, learning Latin for, for the roots of the words so they learn how to spell well. So it's, eclectic is like a mix and match or a hodgepodge of all the different philosophies mixed together. And if you're eclectic, you really kind of need to have um, one of those teacher planners. You can get them for 10 bucks or just like print them off print them off the, um, you know, a free site, um, just to kind of keep track of what you're doing. So you can know, you know, what you're doing because what, you know, you're, you're mixing and matching. So you need to be able to write it down just so you have like a basic plan, but, um, it's kind of choosing what your favorites are and putting it together into what works for your family. And you might be eclectic also, if you have kids that are really different, you know, maybe you have a kiddo that's really kinesthetic and they need to be doing, doing, touching things to learn, and then another one that's visual. So it might be that you'd have to kind of mix and match because of that. Um, no day is really, well, it says no day is really the same, and there, but, but there could be days that are the same. It, it's just flexible depending on what your family's needs are. And then learning is a way of life and happening all the time, similar to what Kristen was saying with um, unschooling. And that's just because, again, you're customizing it to your children's needs and your family's needs and your own desires to really fit what you want it to be. And um, curriculum may or may not be used depending on the subject area, really. So that's eclectic. Okay. And then um, this is really fun. A blogger put on her website, how to determine what your style is. So the link is there, take the quiz. And again, we're gonna share these slides so you'll be able to click on it. Um, and you can just answer the few questions she has to see what you score and to find out what your homeschooling style is, if you're curious. Okay. Um, okay. So this is me. I think this is yes, me. Yes, I think so. I lost track. I'm going back. I know. Where's my notes? Um, so next we're going to talk about learning styles. So we talked about homeschool philosophies or homeschool styles. Now this is talking about like, how does your kiddo learn? Is he or she a visual learner? So do they tend to talk a lot? Do they learn by seeing? You know, do they need to see the picture? If you're reading a book and they know there's a picture there, are they grabbing the book and saying, let me see the picture? I, when I was um, starting to homeschool, I had this picture in my head that I'd be sitting in the chair and all the kids would be down below me looking up with their eyes like this, just listening to me reading the story. No, it wasn't like that. I would be on the couch or in the chair and they'd be climbing all over me because all my kids are visual learners. And so they didn't care whether there was a picture or words. They wanted to see what I was reading. They just couldn't handle it. So auditory though, auditory learners can sit there and listen because they don't have to see it. They tend to speak a little bit slower and they learn by hearing. So books on CD or books on audio are really, really good for these kiddos. And then kinesthetic are those kiddos that need to be doing 
they need to build, they need to be um, kind of moving around to learn. They're the ones that like are really wiggly. So maybe give them some Play-Doh when you're reading a story or give them lots of breaks so they can go walk, you know, go outside and jump on the trampoline in between different subject areas because, or just, just to kind of get the wiggles out um, because they're really, they move around a lot and that's just how they process. So that's learning styles, the top three. Okay, so here's some tips for the visual learner. This is perfect because I have a lot of visual learners. Um, graphs, charts, illustrations, and other visual aids are great. We're gonna talk about curriculum a little bit later and um, a lot of the math curriculum can either be in color or black and white. And my kiddos always love the color because the visual learner thing again. So just keep those kinds of things in mind when you're choosing curriculum um, and how, you know, what type of learner your kiddos are. Um, so other tips include outlines and handouts for the subject matter. So lots of things that they can see. Eliminate potential distractions because if they're visual, then um, they're going to get distracted. Earlier I was on a Zoom and I, I changed my background to, I don't know if you guys have seen the one of Hawaii with the waves. The waves are actually moving. My husband's like, that's totally distracting. And I'm like, oh, you're a visual learner. No, I didn't say that, but, <laughs> but it, it can be, you know, distracting to them if there's other stuff happening in the room. So these are the kiddos that, you know, sometimes you'd put it in the classroom, the, the teacher might put the science board up around their desk because <laughs> they can't focus. They're always getting distracted. Um, so just, you know, keep those things in mind if you have a visual learner. Leave white space and handouts for note taking because they're the note takers. They, they want to draw pictures or they want to take notes. Use multiple screens when showing multi multimedia because they want to see everything going on. And they also benefit from illustra illustrations or presentations that use color, like I mentioned before. Awesome. Okay, and auditory learners, um, they like to begin new material with an explanation of what is coming. So um, again, just like focusing on explaining lots of communication is big for them. Um, conclude with a summary of what was taught. Include activities like brainstorming or discussion groups and um, have the learners verbalize the question um like if you um need to bring the focus back like having them ask the question back to you and um auditory learners also acquire a lot of knowledge by reading aloud um a lot of times like kids have multiple different um learning styles they just are maybe more heavy in one than the other um if you can kind of narrow down their top two and they can use them both together. Like for me, I was definitely visual and auditory. So in college, I would remember um, having to, like it would help me um, really grasp the knowledge a lot more if I read it aloud to myself and I was reading it um, as well, obviously. So just have, seeing the words and hearing the words together really helped me grasp the concept a lot better. And then um, the kinesthetic learner, these are my boys, or at least my oldest for sure. Um, so use activities that will allow the learners to move, play music during activities, provide highlighters and colored pencils to have something to do with their hands, um, give frequent stretch breaks, provide a toy to keep their hands busy. Um, for my boy, he like if i'm ever requiring him to sit down for like more than five or ten minutes i mean he's five so he's little still but um giving him something that he can do with his hands like play-doh but um i would keep in mind try not to do anything that's going to be too loud like legos also are maybe even like too much of a distraction like they're thinking about what they're building so something like um wiki sticks is also a really great thing those they're like wax covered um yarn that you can build stuff with um just anything like sensory is really great that's quiet <laughs> when you're reading aloud um or having reading directions or explaining a concept to them um kinesthetic learners also enjoy 
field trips and tasks that involve manipulating materials. So um, also like project based, like things where you're doing something with your hands. Like I'm thinking like making those like models that I remember doing in elementary school of like a cave and the stalactites and the stalagmites and volcanoes and things like that where they're actually seeing it come together and, and forming it with their hands. All right, we are moving on to curriculum. And um, I'm gonna start with the Charlotte Mason style curriculum. So these are just, again, um, just a handful of options. Um, some of the top ones that Shannon and I collected together. Um, so the first one is Peaceful Press. It is written by a homeschool mom of seven and it started off, I believe, as a preschool curriculum. And um, it, sorry, there's a couple more people in the waiting room. We're getting more people. Um, it started off as a preschool curriculum and it has, she's expanded it to elementary. I'm not sure if it's past elementary yet. I don't know, Shannon, do you know? Um, she has it go through sixth grade right now, but I do know people that use it through eighth and they just, you know, bump up the assignments. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it is wonderful. I am planning on using it for my children next year. It's a Charlotte Mason approach that's um, very literature based. So um, you, the pre Peaceful Preschool is the preschool program, but it's actually um, recommended anywhere from ages two to six. And um, that's what I'm going to be using because I have a four-year-old and a five-year-old turning six. And um, I was gonna talk about special needs. I'm probably not gonna to touch on that tonight, but I can answer questions. My, just to give a little background, my son, my oldest is on the autism spectrum. And I um, love the Charlotte Mason philosophy for him because it really um, emphasizes the short lessons, which is great for him because he can't sit for a long period of time and the consistency and just having it be every single day, short lessons that are rich and meaningful. Um, so for um, Peaceful Press, you if you just go on the website, you can see that it's just so beautiful, all the um, options that she has. The Peaceful Preschool goes um, through, I think 26 books and each week is um, you're going to read a book and you're going to focus on a letter of the alphabet and they integrate things like recipes to make together, um, art and music, I believe. Uh, there's so much to it. And then as you move on, she has, um, I think it's three different options for ages six to 12 and it's based on different periods in history. Um, Shannon, do you know a little bit more about that or no? Oh, uh, the Peaceful Press? Yeah, so she has a, um, the Playful Pioneers, which is uh, based on the Little House series, but she doesn't do all nine books. Okay. She does five, I believe. And then she does have an Ancients one. So it's very similar to um, some of the other ones we've talked about with covering either literature or a certain period in history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I recommend mm -hmm it up if you feel like the Charlotte Mason style kind of speaks to you. Yes. Queen, yeah. Queen Homeschool is another option. It's written by a homeschool mom and author who's been writing since 1994. Um, written to, um, and Shannon, you use this one, right? So I want to let you talk about it if you have. Sure. So Queen Homeschool is, um, it's, Sandy Queen is the author. It's based basically her last name, but she has a ton of different resources and curriculum available on her website, queenhomeschool.com. She um, has language, all the different subject areas, but it's a Charlotte Mason approach, and it's very, very easy to adapt into your home if you're interested in the Charlotte Mason approach. Um, a lot of my kids before, you know, years ago when we first started, we went the Charlotte Mason Queen Homeschool route and they had the language lessons and they would do one lesson a day and it would just cover different topics. And it was just really, um, what would be gentle? The gentle art of learning is kind of a Charlotte Mason term. And it, I would definitely say it's the gentle, gentle approach to learning. So if you're wanting to try to Charlotte Mason approach, 
kind of a family friendly way, I definitely recommend Queen Homeschool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ambleside Online is another great one. It's a website that has a bunch of free resources and curriculum for Charlotte Mason. I was just kind of fiddling around on there the other day, and it it had a lot of very useful, helpful tips, um, including um, how to schedule out your day, when to do, like what subjects are daily subjects and what subjects are weekly subjects, because with Charlotte Mason, this is the one where you're doing art and music and um, composer studies and all of these like very um, rich um, subjects. But when you see that, it kind of feels a little overwhelming. You're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to fit all of this into my child's education? But then when you look at it as these like reading and math and handwriting, she focuses a lot on copy work. Um, so those are like the daily topics that you're going to do consistently, short lessons every day. And then, um, music and art and composer and nature walks. Those are the things that you're going to touch on like once a week and you can, um, kind of do a loop schedule with that. A loop schedule is super helpful for Charlotte Mason where you have, you say you pick four topics, like the four I just mentioned, and you, these are things that you want to touch on um, this school year with your kids. It can, you can kind of, um, what's the word, um, self-sabotage yourself when you say you want to do too much and like say you assign art to Mondays and um, compu- composer studies to Tuesdays, but Let's just say like the first three Mondays of the school year, you have things going on. You have a doctor's appointment for your kids or a dentist appointment or something. And um, you don't get to the composer study or whatever was on Monday. Um, The loop schedule kind of helps you avoid that by saying when you have that time, um, when you don't have those one-off things, this is the thing you're going to talk about. So, um, just like great tips like that you can find on Ambleside online and um Charlotte simply Charlotte Mason I'm gonna go go across the bottom because that's another one I'm very familiar with um just some beautiful um art artist studies like for example you can get like a artist study on just Monet and um see all of his different um pieces of art and the history behind it They also have composer studies and they come with um, audio CDs. So it's just so like I could spend hours on the website just looking at all the different um, options and things that I want to expose my my children to. And Angela Odell is another option. I'm not super familiar with it, but it is, um, I know, a very popular Charlotte Mason curriculum option. It's a homeschool mom and author. Um, she has books and curriculum in all the subject areas and grades. Okay. Okay. And so I'm going to cover um, the, some of the curriculum options for the traditional approach. Um, the, the top three at the, at the top of the screen are um, all with a Christian um, kind of foundation. So Abeka, it's funny, I used to teach fifth grade and, um, before I had children and, and we used Abeka at the school I taught at. And so when I started homeschooling, I just went right to that, you know, curriculum because it's what I knew. It was what I was familiar with, but I only used it for a year because it just, I didn't want to reinvent a traditional classroom in my home. It didn't work very well for me, but it was great to get me through that first year just to try things out. So I really like it for that. Um, It's very colorful, very traditional, lots of workbooks and textbooks combined. Um, Bob Jones is very similar to the Abeka, um, colorful textbooks, workbooks. And then there's SOS or Life Packs, which is the Alpha Omega. And I was just going to show that to you right here. Here's an example of one of the Life Packs. The thing that I love about the Life Pack is that they're for each grade, for each subject, this one's science. Can see science right here. Um, each subject and each grade, so this is fourth grade, has 10 units. This is the 10th unit, unit 10. 
And so for the child that gets super overwhelmed by a big giant textbook, the life packs are great because you're like, here's your teeny tiny thin workbook that you have to do. And they finish it in a month and then the next month they get a new one and it's all fresh and clean and they get to start over again. And it just continues on. But they, they've basically taken the big giant textbook and divided it into 10 little units to use. So my kids really like that because they feel like they're accomplishing things quickly, my two youngest. Um, it's really colorful too. You can see all the colors. So I like it. It's easy to grade. Um, I just go through and grade it once a week and give them feedback and then they just progress through their life packs. Um, so I like the life packs also when you're busy. Like if you have two working parents, and you do not have time to do a lot of prep, and you don't have time to do a lot of grading and, and, and lesson planning and getting stuff done, um, this is great. You, the, the kids know exactly what to do. I put little boxes on the chalkboard and they check them off. Okay, did my language life pack, I did my math, I did my history, did my science, done. And then I know they're doing it, and then I grade it at the end of the week and, and we're good to go to the next week. So it's very simple. Um, time for Learning, IXL, and K-12 are all secular, traditional approach curriculum. Time for Learning is online. You might have heard of it. I call it vintage cartoon videos. I was kind of surprised. I ordered it for one of my students a long time ago when it first started getting popular. And I was like, well, these cartoons look like they're from the 80s or something. Like, what's going on? I don't know what happened, but they took the, the old cartoons and made lessons out of them. But it's really great for families that are just starting and they want to have kind of an online approach because it's self-grading. And you can see right away what your kiddos have accomplished and standards that they've, um, that they've learned and they've mastered. Um, IXL is more of a modern... Um, online curriculum and same type of thing as Time for Learning offers. It's aligned to standards, it's self-grading, you can assign um, all of the lessons in each of the core academic areas. And then K-12 is a curriculum you can order. It's, it, it does have a little bit of um, paper that you have to print off as well as an online component. And they also are a charter school. So you can enroll in their virtual charter school and use their curriculum as well. They're, they're not all over California, but they're in certain counties, and, and I couldn't tell you whether they're accepting enrollment or not based on what's happening with charter schools right now, but they are also a charter school. Yeah. Okay, and the classical approach, um, just some top three curriculums for that are The Well-Trained Mind by Susan Weisbauer. Um, that, a, a well-known, um, option that people use from there is story of the world which we're going to talk about in a little bit with history um it focuses on um it's christian based it talks about um although story of the world is more neutral i believe it's like more yeah it is considered neutral. secular because um it does give a lot of like the christian history like in the ancients especially but it does include all of the other um cultures so it's considered a well-rounded curriculum representing all the different faiths. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's a really popular one. Um, but the well-trained mind is the parent company and True. they're wonderful, yeah. lots of great options there. Classical conversations, which we talked about earlier. Um, it's Christian based and it has the co-op component also, which is really great for creating that community. And Memoria Press, um, which is a Christian worldview. Um, and this is a curriculum I've used with my um, oldest son. They have a specific um, special needs curriculum too. Um, classical, like we were saying, tends to be a little bit more advanced. And um, but there's things about it that I just loved so much. I loved the memorization. Um, I loved the literature, like everything based off of literature and um, adding in Bible um, scripture memorization. So I loved that, but it was just too advanced for us. So I saw that they have something called um, Simply Classical, which is geared for um, students with learning diffic difficulties or special needs. And it just kind of um, takes out a lot of the extras and just leaves the meat and even um, 
kind of brings it down a little bit more. And um, it's been wonderful for us. I have loved it. And um, just a little like personal story here. Before um, last summer, before I started homeschooling my oldest, um, he is pretty delayed verbally and he hadn't ever um, said more than um, a couple words strung together. He could repeat back single words, but not string them together. So uh, we started doing this curriculum and um, we, it starts with the children memorize a prayer, they memorize um, scripture. And that was the first time that he ever said a sentence, a strung, a, a full sentence together. And I bawled because he just, he memorized it and he could say it. And it was just so like, it gave me so much hope. Um, so that was really just a wonderful thing about that. And they, and it's super rich. Um, like I said, we're kind of eclectic. So we take some classical, some Charlotte Mason, some traditional, like all of, a lot of it actually. And um, anyways, Memoria Press is great if you want to learn more about classical. That's awesome. Okay, so some curriculum with a unit study approach, um, a really great curriculum, Bookshark. They are a secular company that um, basically took a Christian curriculum called Sunlight and created it into a um, secular um, version. And so um, they uh, developed the curriculum kind of built around a period in history. So um, I, I don't have it memorized, but some of their units um, start with ancient period and then it'll be like U.S. history one for the year and then U.S. history two for the year and it's very literature focused so there's a lot of books that the child reads on their own independently and then there's read alouds um, and their curriculum it starts in TK and goes up through ninth grade it's a really adaptable curriculum for grade ranges so if you have um, let's say a third and a fifth grader you can actually put them on the same path in Bookshark, like you can order the same um, curriculum for the year and there's um, a way to make it a little bit more challenging for your older child and a little bit easier for your younger child, but then you can essentially read all the same read alouds, they can read all the same independent books together. Um, <clears throat> some examples of historical fiction unit studies, again we already talked about the Prairie Primer, that's Little House One and American Girlhood is also um, one that uses the American Girl books. And then My Father's World is another one um, that actually we're gonna use this year. I'm super excited about it. We're gonna be, here it is right here. This is the old version, but it's um, countries and cultures. And basically um, in this curriculum, we're gonna be studying each week a different country. Some countries will spend one or two weeks on, um, but I'm just really excited because it goes into all these different things like we learn the language, we learn the geography of that country, we learn um, uh, missionaries that went to that country. So, um, so I'm just, you know, excited to teach my kids all about the different countries in my father's world. My father's world also has um, four other units, four other years that you can learn um, about different periods in history. So they recommend starting with the countries and cultures like we're going to be doing. And then next year they go into ancients, and then I believe it's medieval times or middle ages, and then it's US history one and US history two. So it's a five year program. And then you start over again. So that's, that's oh, cool. the unit study approach. Okay, and then unschooling, there's not specific curriculum for it. Um, again, it's child led parent, parent coach approach. So really you kind of pick and choose resources. I mean, you can use Google, you can use, um, books you find at the library. You can use YouTube, like obviously under parent discretion, but um, you kind of bring a lot of different tools to the table to learning about that one topic that interests your child. Um, so yeah, do you want to talk about anything else about that, Shannon? No, I think that's great. I think that the main thing with unschooling that is different than any of the other curriculum or philosophies is, is that it's um, interest-led or child-led versus parent-led. Because even like unit studies can be unschooling, but it's really the parent that's pushing the learning versus the child kind of pushing the learning, if that kind of makes sense. Definitely. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. And then the last one is the eclectic. And there's not really, again, because we don't want to put it into a box. The eclectic is about what is resonating with you and making uh, the best choices for your family and for you. So taking those those different philosophies and the different curriculum choices and blending it together into a personalized plan just for your family. Okay. So like Kristen, that. how are we doing on time? Are we doing pretty good? It's 8.50. So I feel like we could probably get through these next couple slides pretty quick and okay. touch on that. And then we want to have a and a time with everybody too. Yeah. Questions. Okay. I'm just trying to remember, am I doing this slide 30? Okay, yes. So um, language arts, just some more, um, some other curriculum options I'm going to quickly go through for specifically language arts. All about reading. It's a very popular um, option and it also um, has all about spelling as another component that you can add in. It's secular, it's um, parent intensive, um, very parent intensive teacher led versus like kind of open and go, the kids can do it independently. Um, it, it tends to be on the pricey side at the beginning because there's a lot um, of materials you get along with it. Um, but I believe you can just add on the workbooks later on if you are doing it with your other children who are um, going through the um, grade levels. It emphasizes reading aloud. It's mastery based, so it's going to um, it's going to really like focus on each concept until a mastery is built. Versus spiraling, which will um, come back to the the concepts to touch on them for review. It's very comprehensive. It includes um, a letter tiles app um, that you can purchase that is a component of the uh, curriculum. It's targeted reading instruction. So it's very, like if you want your kids to learn to read, this is like a really great option. It's just, it touches on everything, um, phonics, grammar. Um, it's great for kinesthetic learners because there's a lot of like things to do with your hands. It's also really great for struggling learners and those with learning disabilities. Um, I have lots of families who have used this and all about spelling and their kids just, they grasp it so well. Um, so this is like an example of me being eclectic because I love like the Charlotte Mason classical approach, but then like for reading, I tend to kind of like second guess myself sometimes and I'm like, oh, I want to pick a curriculum that's not going to leave any stone unturned. <laughs> and this one is um, a great option for that. Moving Beyond the Page is another great one. It's secular, it's teacher-led, it's unit studies, project-based, literature-based, it's great for kinesthetic learners, um, and it's also family style, meaning that you can do it with multiple grade levels, and it's also very hands-on and engaging. Book Shark is another great one. It's secular. It tends to be a little bit more advanced. It's literature-based, traditional approach, includes um, like Schoolhouse Rock DVDs, um, read alouds, uh, different, so for, liter for language arts, they have grammar, wordly wise, which is a vocabulary curriculum. It's an all-in-one parent-led package, another really great one that's very comprehensive. Um, and then Sunlight is the Christian version of Bookshark. Um, it is, um, also, people say it tends to have a little bit of a Charlotte Mason flair because it is literature based. And um, it's one of those where at the beginning, it might be a little bit more teacher intensive, but as your kids kind of um, get the hang of the routine, they're able to be a little bit more independent with it as you go on in the year. That gives you a very robust and strong foundation in language arts. And um, yeah, you guys can search the links there too. Um, and then I'm doing math, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then math is um, a couple great ones are teaching textbooks. Shannon, you use this one, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I love it. Maybe you should say a little bit about it. Okay. So we um, discovered teaching textbooks when my oldest was uh, 
maybe like sixth or seventh grade. And we had used Abeka and Saxon and Matthew C. And I felt like every year I was changing. And then teaching textbooks came along and I was like, okay, I'll try something else. And she just did so well on it. And then, so then I ended up, it starts in third grade. So I ended up putting all my kiddos that were third and up in it. And it's on the computer and basically it covers all the standards for whatever grade level or whatever um, high school subject area. And it's so well written and um, so engaging that the kids just grasp the concepts. It really takes a lot of the burden off of teaching math for, especially in the older grades, um, for the parent. Um, never had to get a math tutor. And all of my kids are, they're mostly for visual learners, but they all thrived. And it really hits um, visual and auditory because it's a video lesson that they watch and, um, and then they do the lesson. And if they miss a problem, it's self-grading. So if they miss a problem, they can go back and rewatch that part of the lesson that covered that skill that they missed. And so it teaches independent learning too. They're not depending on you to teach them. Although, you know, that does happen sometimes. My kiddos will like, mom, I'm not understanding it. And I'll have to go over there and teach them the concept. But generally speaking, they go to their computer at math time and they do their math and then they'll yell out at me their, their percentage. It's really funny. Like all that, like got a 95, you know, and I'm like, okay, good job. And if it's less than 90, they have to redo it. So it just is really adaptable and it just keeps them plugging away at all the different lessons that they need to learn. I, I love it. Good younger. It sounds I awesome. Know. I have, okay, I will tell you, cause I, I'm the same way. Like I, I mean, they're in second grade. I'm like, come on, I need a second grade. So I've started all of my youngest three started math three in okay. second grade. And I just, I just had them do it two or three days a week. So they went slower. Okay. They were able to. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I know teaching textbooks is really popular too. It's used by a lot of people um, who need, who maybe don't feel super confident in teaching math, especially as the kids get older. So that's a great one to look into. Right Start is another um, highly popular one. It tends to be a little bit more expensive on the front end because you do get a lot of, um, different manipulatives and um, just tools to use, but it is one that is recommended for Charlotte Mason approach. Um, it is used, gosh, I've just seen it recommended by a lot of different philosophies. Um, it's highly parent involved, um, but it is great for those students that are kinesthetic, that, um, maybe struggle with learning math, um, have special needs, um, because it is a, a combo of the mastery and the spiral, where it really, just from what I've heard from families that have used it, they just, they really come out of it with a very concrete understanding of it all. Um, it use, utilizes math games and music as well. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's one that I've been looking into for my own son, um, as well as Matthew C, which is the next one. It's another one that's a little bit more money at the beginning to get all the um, pieces, but it, you don't have to buy as much later on. It's traditional um, style. It's great for visual and kinesthetic learners. It's mastery based. It has video lessons and um, cyclical black and white. Uh, it has a black and white workbook and it's um, TK through 12 for grades. Um, math Lessons for a Living Education is a Charlotte Mason inspired math curriculum. It's story based. Um, so you, it just helps those kids who um, kind of like just gives them a better, um, a rounded understanding of it. And it is TK through sixth grade. I can add. Uh, I can plug in a little thing about what I meant when I typed this story thing. So basically yeah. it's really cool. So what, what it does is you have your 36 weeks, your 36 lessons and the very first day on Monday, there's a little story. And the one we were using, 
this, I love this curriculum for K one, two. And then I bump into, I go right into teaching textbooks. Okay. So the one I was using was about grandma and grandpa's farm. And these, these, um, twins, these twin boy and girls, boy and girl go to the grandma and grandpa's farm throughout the whole story. So the first chapter, the first week is like them going to the farm. And then all the lessons are about the farm. So they're doing addition problems and there's a picture of chickens and eggs and, you know, it's just, and the story kind of leaves you hanging. So then they're like wondering what's going to happen next week, you know, and then the next Monday they read a little bit more of the story. So it's really engaging that way. It kind of combines that, um, living book, Charlotte Mason ish type approach with math. It's kind of fun. So cool. I know. I want to look more into that one too. Um, Abeka is the next one. It's traditional, colorful, independent workbooks, um, very open and go, um, tends to be a little bit more advanced. Yeah. That's um, about a year ahead. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. I have a family that has used it and they switched to another curriculum. I think it was Matthew C. And mm-hmm. they were like, my it's kid knows me. everything. <laughs> like, <laughs> <too easy. laughs> yeah. I ended up switching back to Abeka just because it yeah. ended up working great for them, the traditional approach for math, which sometimes that's what it is. Like, yeah. like Shannon was saying, like you like the Charlotte Mason for literature, language arts, but you want something more traditional, straightforward for math. Yeah. So, and it is, and it's Christian and it's built yeah. um, into pretty much all of it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Life of Fred is another really popular option. It's, it is another literature story-based approach to math. Um, short lessons, it's great for those who don't tend to click with the traditional approach. And it is also TK through 12. Then we have Singapore, um, which is using the metric system. It's highly successful cyclical approach and um tk through 12 and cyclical i think are you meaning spiral shannon is that the same thing okay yeah i just wanted to make sure yeah so it's it's and that's basically like she was saying it just repeats so they're they're not just going to learn fractions in november and never learn or have another lesson on fractions so spiral or cyclical is just like you're repeating you have like maybe one or two problems and fractions every single lesson or every couple lessons so they don't forget it. Got it. And versus Matthew C, which, um, I, what I've heard is that it's more mastery. Like you talk, that's right. More, um, yeah. Like each year it's like, you're going to really hone in on addition, subtraction, and then Mm -hmm. you're going to move on to the next one. And it, it builds upon each other. Yes. the Abeka, which some people really like that in Singapore, where it always comes back and it keeps your kids remembering and reviewing concepts they've learned before. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Horizons is another um, traditional option. It's colorful, um, another spiral approach. And Saxon, um, same thing, same sort of thing. So those are great options for you guys to look into. All right. And I'm going to cover science and history. So I do not have experience in, in like all of these, but I will just touch on them because we wanted to include kind of the top curriculum, the most popular curriculum going right now. So in science, we have Berean, which is not expensive. It's more of a family style, Charlotte Mason style. Um, do you have any experience in this, Kristen? I in don't. The- I yeah. just um, know that it's used by um, a couple of families that have multiple age kids. Got it. Got it. We've kind of already talked about sunlight, but they are a more literature, real, real books approach. Um, it's, um, kind of like you can use sunlight just for science or you can use their whole program and it incorporates everything, um, all in one, um, Alpha Omega publishing, which is AOP and then Bob Jones university, which is BJU and Abeka are all the traditional textbook approach, which we've kind of already touched on. Real Science for Kids, we haven't talked about that yet, and that's a really, really fun um, curriculum. It's really for TK through six. It's a classical and a Charlotte Mason approach kind of combined into one. So they use a lot of the classical type literature and approach in their lessons, but then they have some lessons that are Charlotte Mason, so the kids might be doing some copy work or some dictation or narration, 
it's story based. So there's usually a story associated with the lesson. It's child center, centered and family friendly, and meaning that you can use a, a broad range of grades and use the same curriculum or the same unit. Master books is a traditional approach curriculum. Apologia and master books are, are pretty similar in their um, traditional approach. They're both, uh, the asterisk means they're a Christian curriculum. And Apologia is a little bit more Charlotte Mason and family friendly than, uh, well, master books is too. They both, they both have that flair. Um, elemental science, I've used that as well. One of my um, daughters was going to a two-day week class, and they used elemental science, and it's really fun. They have one book that you read. It's a chapter a week, I believe, and it's, again, like that story. So you read this read-aloud book, and then all of their lessons are built around the story. So it was an adventure story. Uh, these two, this family, was the one that she was reading was um, geology. And so they were traveling all over the world. So they would travel to um, South America and they might be in a country where there is a, a volcano and then they would learn about volcanoes. So it's just, you know, you follow this story and then it inspires the child to want to learn more. And then it has the lessons related to the story. So it's kind of a fun, fun curriculum to use. Okay. And then there's social studies and history. Um, again, we, already talked a little bit about Bob Jones. Um, that's the traditional, it's really good for visual auditory learners. It's textbook, online, video-based, just your classic traditional curriculum. Story of the World, we've kind of talked a little bit about that too. It's the classical approach. Um, similar to the elemental science, it's a, a, a standalone book story. And then they have an activity book that goes along with the story that you read each week, the read aloud. I think Story of the World is twice a week that you read from the Read Aloud book. Um, and Story of the World is broken into four volumes. So volume one is Ancients, volume two is Middle Ages, and volume three and four are U.S. History one and two. Actually, I think they call it World History, but a lot of U.S. History is incorporated into the World History. Um, then there's Truth Quest History. And again, this is a Christian curriculum. There's a lot of Christian curriculum just because um, traditionally speaking, the homeschool movement was kind of driven by parents that were not happy with the public school system. So a lot of this curriculum came out of that movement in the 70s and 80s. Um, of course, it's been revamped and renewed. But, um, but Truth Quest is a classical and Charlotte Mason style into one literature based and it ties in drama art and literature so if your kiddos are into drama art or literature you might want to take a look at truth quest and then we have beautiful feet beautiful feet has been around forever it's literature based they're little packets based on a book and then it goes di dives deep into history and other subject areas F family style and open and go and then curiosity chronicles i haven't heard of this one but it's a secular option for families it's written as a dialogue or a script, and it comes with an audio. So if you have any auditory learners, this one might be good for you. It's a classical approach, and it works for any learning style. Okay. All right. So what's next? Okay. We didn't really talk about this, but a, um, Homeschooling 101 or Homeschool 101 is sponsored by Heart of Homeschooling, Teaching the Homeschool Lifestyle. Heart of Homeschooling is a... Um, I don't know if you want, it's a, it's a group that I started about six months ago just to support the homeschooling parent. So I have a website, heartofhomeschooling.org, if you want to find out more information about homeschooling or if you like what we're talking about here. We are also creating a Homeschool 101 website. It's in the works right now. We're going to include the slides. We're going to include the recording from tonight, and we're also going to include more materials um, and more resources because we just, Kirsten and I just have a heart of wanting to help. And we wanna get the information out there as quickly as possible. So some of the other things we're gonna be adding to that site and maybe doing another Zoom in the future, um, things like organizational tips, how to organize your home, how to organize your space, how to organize all the paperwork and all the projects, creating a mission statement for your family. How do you start a co-op if you're interested in building a community where you live? Um, how to fill out a private school affidavit. Some of you are really discouraged because you can't get in a charter school. 
and things have changed in the rules this year. So your next option is to create a private school affidavit. So you are perfectly legal to homeschool in the state of California if you're in California, and we will show you how to do that. Special needs, like Kirsten was talking about, she has a heart for special needs kiddos, so she wants to give as much information and knowledge all about that. Homeschooling on a budget, that's important in these times for sure. Records and more. So put in the chat if you would like us to cover any topics that aren't listed there, and we will do our best to include that on that site that we're building. Um, if you wanna be a part of our email, like group, we'll put together a group so we can send you information to, go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, August 3rd, I've been asked, and I've asked Kirsten, but it's her anniversary, so I don't know if she's going to be joining us, but I've been asked by the by a group here up in Northern California to speak in person, so if you do live in Northern California around Sacramento area at the Rock Church at 7 o'clock, I'll be posting on Facebook, but I'm going to be speaking in their auditorium um, just about basic homeschooling things and answering questions and things like that, so I just wanted to let you all know that. And um, we can have our Q&A time now. Yeah. So feel free to put a question in the chat and, um, and or your email, and we'll go ahead and answer them as they pop up. Kristen, it looks like there's a question for you regarding autism. Okay. Um, all right. I'll just read it. So Kirsten, my son is also on the autism spectrum and has combined type ADHD and he's quite bright. I love the idea and philosophy of Charlotte Mason, but I'm concerned about the repetition because he hates repeating things once he feels he understands. He's constantly rushing through materials. Can Charlotte Mason still work for him? Um, I would say yes, because there's no need to keep repeating it if he's gotten the concept you can move on to the next one like that's um you know it it really does work great i think for autism and adhd because it really focuses on those short meaty lessons and you know and reviewing until it um is mastered and then moving on to the next topic um the things that are repeated are like um you know, if you're a Christian, they will often do um, some scripture memorization. And um, there's so many different ways to do that and um, how you can memorize like hundreds of verses in a school year because of how you um, touch on them. Like there's certain ones that you do every day. Once they're mastered, they go into like the once a week um, file folder, and then it can be moved to once a month. And really, I mean, it's up to you as the mom. You can kind of pick and choose, like the eclectic style. You can pick things from the Charlotte Mason method that you love, and you don't have to do the things that repeat over and over again if that's not um, something that works for you. So, um, I, it's also really great for special needs because it focuses on habits and um, that's great for um, kiddos who are struggling with life skills and um, just learning those basic um, self-help um, skills. So it, it just ties all that in because that's all a part of life and learning. So that's one, um, one reason why I think it's really great for um, special needs. And then, yeah, any thoughts on moving beyond the page's new math curriculum? It seems very similar to Right Start. Oh, have you looked into that one, Shannon? I haven't, no, that's really awesome to hear there's some more options though. Yeah, because um, I'll have to look into that because um, moving beyond the page, um, I've looked into a lot of their um, language arts, but I haven't really looked into their math. So, but I know that they have all the subjects, I believe. Yeah. So I'll, I'll look into it, but right start, I know, because um, I thought moving beyond the page is more unit studies, but right. I don't know. It's interesting. I'll have to look into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are we HSTs? I am an HST and Shannon has been an HST. 
I took a different path in my career recently. So I actually am working on my doctorate and um, I am creating courses and teaching courses for HSTs to learn how to support homeschooling families. And she is such, she's been a mentor to me from the beginning. Like when I first started teaching at a charter school, it was with Shannon and she's um, just, I've learned so much from her. So she's. I learned so much from you. (laughs) And I'm really excited that this homeschool 101 and just the heart of homeschooling is happening because it really is um, such a resource to homeschooling moms who maybe need a little bit more encouragement and guidance. And gosh, I just feel like I'm just always learning new things too. It's yes. just, there's so many different, I don't know, just homeschooling. It's like the, the choices are endless. You can't ever learn everything, <laughs> you know? It's true. Uh, always learning for sure. Yes. yes. Oh, thanks Lily. That's really sweet. And Ashley, uh, the question at the bottom. Okay. Oh wait, Ashley did say, "What curriculum would you recommend to most closely cover what they would do in public school?" Mm-hmm. I think. Um, so Ashley, I think this is Ashley Ho, one of my friends, um, and she, I think, has a first grader and a kindergartner, or second grader and kindergartner. So. Maybe IXL would be a good one. Mm-hmm. Um, that is the online version that it's really great. You can literally check off concepts as you go, which is very great for us perfectionist <laughs> type mm-hmm. A people. It's like, oh, completed yeah. that, move on. Um, so what else, Something Shannon? Else. So I just was thinking, because I had, you know, when it was an HST, I would have Um, families sometimes that for whatever reason they were only going to homeschool for a year and they knew they were going to put their kids back into public school so I actually always recommended that they use what the public school is using true you know because Mm -hmm. then it's an easier transition for them and there aren't any holes and so you can easily do that by just calling your district and asking what curriculum they use Mm -hmm. and I know lots of homeschoolers who have done that Mm -hmm. Um, we used, when I taught in the public school, we used Envision for math and, Mm -hmm. um, I've known a couple homeschoolers who have used it too. Yeah. So yeah, you can do it at home. You can do the the curriculum at home. It'll be way less time. You know, you'll be done in half the time. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be great. Uh, Okay. So let's see what else is there. Um, just people thanking us. Thank you for coming, everyone. Very so exciting. So fun. Um, oh, Ashley Freeman, if a child is currently enrolled in a public charter and you want to switch to a PSA homeschool, what is the process timeline for enrolling from the public school and getting an affidavit filed? That's a really good question. We will have a section on the on the site. I personally have never done it, but I do know that when you um, unenroll or disenroll from your current school, you need to, um, like call them and find out each school is a little bit different process. Some want it in writing. So you might have to email them. You just need to find out what they need from you. It could be just a verbal over the phone, but you might need to put it in writing mm-hmm. that you're disenrolling. If you're in a charter school, it's always good etiquette to let your teacher know that you're doing this because your teacher has you on their roster. So they may be planning on having you be a part of their, you know, family of um, students. So you want to let your teacher know so it's not a surprise to them. And then then um, in October is when the new school year starts for the state of California for, um, for filing your private school affidavit. But my understanding, Kirsten, correct me if I'm wrong, they can begin the process now. Like you can get the paperwork offline, fill yeah. it out, and turn it in. You're just not legally... A private school until October. Yes, that's what I understand too. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, Shannon and I both need to do a little bit more research on this. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to give you guys more information on that though, because I know that that's something a lot of people are looking into. So we hope maybe we'll do another Zoom or a video or something. Um, uh, that would be fun. Not that. 
Yeah. Um, this is a good question. Do you know if there are any laws governing the micro schooling co-op concept movement? I'm seeing so much about it's new to me. Thank you guys so much. So basically you can homeschool in California three different ways. Number one, through a public school, public charter school, some ISP associated with public school, something with a public school. Number two, you can homeschool um, by becoming a private school, a private school affidavit, filling that information out and becoming a private school. Or number three, you can homeschool by having a credentialed teacher tutor your children. And that would fall under this micro schooling. So credential teacher then can teach a group of children or pod or co-op. And that's totally legal. They can do that. Um, if a parent doesn't have a credential and they want a micro school or, or let's say I didn't have my credential and I wanted to teach eight, you know, kids in the neighborhood that wanted to homeschool and I didn't have my credential, I'd have to do the private school affidavit route. And they would essentially enroll in my private school. So it's legal. So there, those are the three ways. Um, and so these, my, the micro schooling movement, it's, it's so fun to me that people are coming up and thinking outside the box with these new ways, new creative ways in the environment that we're in to make this work for everybody. Because some parents are, you know, in two income households and they have to go back to work and they don't know what they're going to do. So this is a great solution. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, I think so. And then, yeah, that was my friend, Ashley Ho. So yeah, I would do um, the curriculum that you're doing in school if you want, or Lily, um, who's another HST, she recommended K-12. It's very standards-based. Um, if you didn't want to use the same curriculum, also IXL, like I said earlier, is a great option. Okay, people are interested in organizing and motivation. Yes, we will be posting any future Zooms to Shannon's, to the Heart of Homeschooling probably, and I can share on my page too. Oh, thanks, Sully, for putting the website. And I just put the Facebook group for Heart of Homeschooling on there as well. Okay. If you guys want to join, all are welcome. Oh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, and you switched to home homeschool after October. Um, I believe you can file a private school affidavit, you know, all through like after October as well. Or is there a deadline? I actually don't know. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not positive on that. Oh, I mean, it, it almost makes logical sense that there would be a deadline. So mm. we will look oh. at that and give you an answer. Oh. I know the CDE website has information on private school affidavit. So you can go to the CDE website and find out. Yeah. CDE.com. I think somebody's trying to talk. Who was that? It was me. I want oh, this really? Lily. Um, I wanted to say that anyone can file for private affidavit even after October deadline because you can start a private school at any time. So okay. whenever they start it, that's when they file it uh, for the current school year. Oh, thank you, Lily. That's great. Yeah. To know. I looked at it before as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This is so wonderful. And um, I can tell how much a time and love you've put into this. And I'm so grateful that um, you've done this. This is an amazing resource to so many people out there. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so that's good to know. Thanks for sharing that information, Lily. Um, I know that it's a popular topic. So yes, yeah, we need to figure out how to get the information out. Yeah, I think that and co-ops are gonna be the hot topics because yeah. people can do those on their own and make them happen, so yeah. Do you know, happen to know if this private school affidavit crosses over to other states? We just moved to Oregon. So every state has their own um, rules for homeschooling. So I always recommend, there is a Christian website, HSLDA, Homeschool Legal Defense Association, which actually it's really great because they have the whole United States on there. You can click on your state and it will tell you exactly how to homeschool legally in your state. So um, I don't know what the Oregon, oh, perfect, Lily. Thank you. <laughs> <Please are> awesome. <laughs> That's yeah. great. And I know different states also have different requirements for like how long 
you homeschool like yes. um the how many days how many days yeah and then assessments some require you know an annual assessment some don't some require you to turn in paperwork california has the least amount of requirements really mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing yeah yeah and plus the whole charter school thing getting funds through a charter school is correct yeah too um but yeah it's there i would definitely recommend that hslda website because it just yeah. has all that on there so yeah okay well it's getting late thank you so much everyone for joining us this has been really fun i was a little bit nervous kirsten and i talked earlier we're like oh a little bit nervous but we love this we love just telling you know everyone about our passion for homeschooling so i'm so glad if we were able to help in any way mm -hmm. um oh there's one more question i'm homeschooling a tk and preschool kids for the first time the public school is giving us curriculum um i want to incorporate more classical it's probably coming okay <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah so you can um tk and preschool so one a curriculum i recommend looking into um if you are a christian is um it's called the gentle and classical preschool it's very similar to peaceful preschool but it adds in that classical approach um also i would say well-trained does a well-trained mind have anything for preschool tk i was just trying to think of a secular option i know i'm racking my brain right now too um <clears throat> I mean, you can definitely adapt the well-trained mind materials for younger. Um, mm -hmm. It just depends on how. I mean, a lot of it is coloring. Instead of having them write a sentence, they can, you know, write letters, and then you're reading the sentences just to give that um, exposure. So, um, but when it's specifically, that's true. Kindergarten is not required in California, yeah. for sure yeah mm -hmm. yeah gentle and classical preschool is the name and it's um you buy it you can actually get the curriculum it's a free pdf download um if you just want the straight curriculum but she also has some bundles that there's a level one which is like ages two to four and then level two is ages four to six and um they have she has bundles for level one and level two that you can purchase in addition to the free download and it's just awesome how it definitely blends classical and charlotte mason um so it's gentle and um just like if you it kind of just adds a little bit of that um structure into your day if you want to add something else so yeah i write that one i would um <clears throat> I would take a look at um, the classical conversations too, because that starts oh, yeah. in preschool. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and Memoria Press does too. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Memoria Press. We did Simply Classical, which is the special education one with my son. Um, and they have something, it goes all the way down to like, like level, like developmental level age three. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then, oh, does the state give you funds for curriculum if you file for a PSA? No, it does not. No, but there's so many resources available. I know up here in Northern California, I next Monday, there's a book fair where a bunch of people are going to get together and just put their curriculum out for super cheap or free. So there's so many resources. You can purchase curriculum on eBay. Um, there's ways to do it for sure without yeah. that. There's Facebook groups too. That's like, um, like use people can swap their homeschool mm -hmm. curriculum that they're no longer yeah. using. So that's yeah. a resource too. And, yeah. um, yeah, I just like, I've seen stuff at Goodwill. I've seen stuff yeah. all over. So. Come to my garage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think. Oh, one more. Are you required to record grades and do testing if you are PSA? Um, I, I don't think in California they require it. I, I haven't heard. Um, like you do your own recording, like you can record. You want to keep, yourself. yes. So this is what HSLDA re recommends, even though the state doesn't require you to turn in grades or to do assessment, they recommend you do keep records. And we're going to have a section of that on our site how to keep records in an organized fashion in case something crazy happens and your neighbor thinks that you're not doing a good job and reports you or whatever. You just want to be covering all your bases and make sure that if anybody questions you or your, you know, mother-in-law questions you or whatever, you can say, oh, look, you know, here's their report card and um, here's some samples of some of the work that they've been doing. So just to keep, you know, accurate records also for if you decide, to, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future, but they might be going back into public school or into a private school or whatever, you need to have records for that purpose as well. Mm -hmm. So it's always a good idea to keep records, even though it's not technically required. Yeah. I would be very interested in a list of resources for special ed curriculum, specifically ones that oh. show it broken down by developmental age. Okay. That's yeah. I can do that for different, um, and then match it up to the different philosophies because there's options for all of them. So yeah. yeah, I can do that for sure. So we just take note of that. Shannon, should we just have people go to the um, resource site or are we waiting to share that? It's kind of empty right now because okay. we put in the things. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking I can probably put it in there and then we can at least we'll have it. the link. Yeah. Right? Okay. Let's do that. And then just know that we'll be adding to it. Yeah, just know it's kind of empty right now. So I'm going to put the link in the chat. That's the link to the site. And we're just going to be adding information as we go. Um, I'm also <laughs> <laughs> labor of love, right? <laughs> the babysit. <laughs> this is Candace. She's one of my friends from Sac State. Oh, that's sweet. Um, so, and then on my Heart of Homeschooling Facebook group, I'm going to post this, um, you know, video. Oh, I can put it on the YouTube as well. I have a YouTube channel. Oh, so yeah. And it can be shared really easily too. Okay. I will put it on there as well. So people can share it out and get the information. Perfect. All right. All Thanks right. so much everyone for coming. Yes. Thank you. It's been so great. And the questions have been wonderful and um, we'll let you guys know when the next one's coming. Yeah. All right. And let's save the chat so we can grab the um, emails that people put in there too. Oh, okay. Do you know how to do that? Let's see. It has a file button here. Oh, oh yeah. Got it. Save chat. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay. Perfect. Uh, okay. All right, everyone. Have a good evening. Okay. Bye. Bye.